thank you, uh, thank you everybody for your uh, support. Um, you know, this this ministry wouldn't happen if people weren't faithful givers. And so we we thank God for every one of you, those who give uh, physically here and those who give online. You know, we've got people all around the world um, who watch. And uh, so, if you're watching today, just uh, let us know where you're you're um, you're uh, watching from. Amen. Because uh, I think it's a beautiful thing that. Uh, that we can touch the nations from right here in the heart of Dublin, amen? So we're gonna um, read Jeremiah 31, uh, 35 to 37, if we can get that on the screen. And uh, this is the second and final part of a message called Israel and the Believer. And uh, again, I just want to urge you today to, to, to listen, to open your heart, because I really believe, um, you know, if I was to say as a pastor, um, what is the biggest blind spot that the church has with regards to God moving? It's, uh, I don't believe it's necessarily faith or healing or, yes, these are all areas where maybe people can be in ignorance, but there's no greater area, I think, that the church has been in darkness and ignorance than regarding um, our relationship to the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel. And uh, so let's start by reading uh, here together in Jesus' name. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off the seed of Israel for all they have done, says the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. In this passage, the Lord says, he's given us the sun for a light by day. He's given us the moon and the stars for a light by night. Uh, you know, he has created the seas and the waves uh, and he said, if any of these things cease from being, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Now, for, for uh, almost 2,000 years, uh, believers were, were reading these scriptures, and in a way, they didn't make sense because uh, uh, ancient Israel was ancient history. And, uh, and, and yet, we live in a very privileged generation because we have seen the fulfillment of God's promise um, uh, to the Jewish people. And so we're looking at Israel and the believer and the importance of our relationship with each other as Jews and Christians. And it's a relationship that no doubt has historical tensions, misunderstandings, and some terrible wrongs in the past. And uh, while on one level we're not condemned to live in the past, we do need to be aware of it because I think there's a lot that's lost in translation between Jews and Christians. Um, and, and much of it uh, as a result of a co toxic combination of prejudice, ignorance, fear, and bad theology. And so by bad theology, I mean the erroneous teaching that says the church has replaced Israel and the Jewish people are no longer of any importance to God. This isn't biblical, and if true, would render many Bible promises and prophecies to the Jews as null and void, or at least unfulfilled by God. And as we know, God always, always keeps his word. Amen. Deuteronomy 7, 9 to 11 talks about how he is the God who keeps covenant. And so God keeps covenant. He keeps his word. He honors his word. And so one of the primary lies that people believe about Israel is that the people in Israel today are, are different uh, to the Jews of the Bible. And of course they are because the original Jews, um, the original Israelites all died, but these are their descendants. And so if the passage I read in Jeremiah is true, and I believe it is, then the nation of Israel today exists because God foreordained 
that it would be reborn and had it recorded in his word for his glory and for our benefit. And because when we witness the faithfulness of God to the Jewish people, when we witness his, his mercy, his faithfulness, then how can we not be encouraged and inspired? And I want to read some uh, verses here that acknowledge uh, God's promise to the Jewish people. Exodus 36, 22. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you've profaned in your midst. Then the nations will know that I'm the Lord, declares the Lord, when I prove myself holy, among you in their sight, for I will take you from the nations, gather you from the lands, and bring you into your own land. Amos 9, 14 to 15. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I've given them, says the Lord your God. Isaiah 43 and 5, do not fear for I'm with you. I'll bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. And Psalm 66 and verse 8, it says, who has ever heard of this thing? Who's ever seen things like this? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than, the, uh, than she gives birth to her children. Uh, and and uh, amazingly, Isaiah says, can a nation uh, be born in a day? Uh, can a country be born in a day or a nation brought forth in a moment? And amazingly, Isaiah was written about 750 years uh, B.C., and uh, if you think about it, 1948, I haven't uh, done, done the maths, but that's about 2,600 years before the nation of Israel was re-established. And so one of the th th things I see when you study uh, history, when you study what the Lord said about uh, the nation of Israel, you realize how God is a faithful God who keeps his word, he keeps his covenant. And so you can't but see the divine hand of God in this momentous act uh, regarding the rebirth of Israel. And there may not be those, uh, there may be those who don't like it, but they can't deny uh, that this is an act of God because sovereignty means that God does what he wants, when he wants, for whom he wants, in the way he wants, and he doesn't need to ask you or I for permission to do it. I mean, that's the simplest definition of sovereignty you can get. God does what he wants, when he wants, where he wants, for whom he wants, and he, uh, uh, in the way he wants, and he doesn't need to ask any of us for permission um, uh, to do that. And so I appreciate maybe that some of you might have some strong opinions about Israel, but what you think or say about Israel is irrelevant any more than what I think or say is irrelevant. What matters is what does God say in his word. And so I simply ask you today to open your heart and your mind as we look at the word of God today. Because ultimately the Bible is our guide and our foundation. Not CNN, not Al Jazeera, not RTE or BBC. And so I cannot overemphasize the importance of this subject. And, and, and yet, unfortunately, sometimes when you talk about this, it's like many believers, their eyes glaze over uh, because they don't particularly see what, what this has got to do with me. It has everything to do with you, and hopefully this message will give you some, some greater context um, in that regard. And so, if we can't or won't get this right as believers, we will not only have a flawed perspective of the Bible, prophecy, and end time events, we will also end up bringing a curse upon ourselves, our families, and our nations. And the book of Joel uh, warns us of this. Joel chapter 3 and verse 1. And it says this. For behold, in those days, and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They've also divided up my land 
And, and so here God says, one of the reasons he will judge the nations, uh, it, you know, it, there will be sheep and goat nations. And, uh, you know, one of the, 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 the uh, factors, the major factors will be how they dealt with the Jewish people. Because the Bible says here that they, um, uh, they, they divided my land and, um, and, and they, how they treated uh, the, the people of Israel, scattering them among the nations. Psalm 119 and verse 105, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Uh, the Net Bible, your word is a lamp to live by and a light to illumine my path. The Good News Bible, your word is a lamp to guide me and a light for my path. Can we honestly say as we New Testament believers that we have allowed the Bible to guide us in our dealings with Israel and the Jewish people? I think if you study history over the last 2,000 years, I think in many instances, no. And so the question is, therefore, are we willing to walk in the light of his word, even if at times that challenges us, makes us uncomfortable, or contradicts our traditions, our theology, or our culture? Because if we will put aside our prejudice, our traditions, our misunderstandings, and the many lies that abound about Israel and the Jewish people online, um, whom I've pointed out last week, are far from perfect, and in many instances are far from God. And simply look in an unbiased manner at what does God wor God's word say, we will quickly realize that the nation and people of Israel still figure in God's eternal plans and purposes. Romans 11, 28 in the Amplified. From the standpoint of the gospel, uh, the Jews at present are enemies of God for your sake, which is for your benefit. But from the standpoint of God's choice of the Jews as his people, they are still loved by him for the sake of the fathers. Just say that today. They're still loved by him. The Jewish people are still loved by God. And the, the same God who loves the believer uh, loves the people and nation of Israel. And that being so, what exactly do we need to know about them? Well, the believer needs to know that the nation and people of Israel are firstly called. And I know I dealt with that last week, but I, I need to deal with it uh, in a little bit more depth. Um, Genesis chapter 12, we see here God called Abraham and he said, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land I will show you. I'll make you a great nation and I will bless you. I'll make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. And verse um, six and seven, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the turban tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared uh, to him. And so here we have this promise that God promised the land to the Jewish people. God called Abram to leave his family, his home, all that was familiar, go to a land that he would show him and uh, give to him and to his descendants. And according to Jewish tradition, Abraham was born in Ur of the Chaldees in southern Iraq. Um, he was called by God to the land of Canaan, four or 500 miles uh, away. Um, uh, the land of Canaan was located in what is modern day Israel. And so he arrived there approximately 1,850 uh, BC. Um, this was almost 4,000 years ago, and still there is a battle for the land of Israel. I mean, King David made it the capital of Israel uh, 3,500 years ago when he defeated the Jebusites. And yet, in spite of their long presence and ties with the land, uh, there is no doubt that Israel is highly contested territory with both activists and academics, politicians and celebrities, theologians and even terrorists, all having a strong opinion about why Jews shouldn't live in their historical homeland. And, uh, and, and uh, I mean, this is the thing, or even further, why the state of Israel shouldn't even exist. Um, but, but let me say this, whether it's an Islamic terrorist saying that Israel should be destroyed, or so-called leftist progressives arguing why Israel shouldn't exist and working night and day through boycotts and through lobbying and misinformation, I struggle to see the difference because ultimately they both have the same end goal, which is the destruction of Israel. But along with the Bible, uh, 
I think it's important to, to grasp this, that uh, along with the Bible, which contains the story of the Jewish people. And so, like I said, it's, it's inconsistent for us as a Christian to love the God that the Bible will hate the people of the Bible. Uh, the, the Bible contains the story of the Jewish people. Um, but but uh, beyond the Bible, the, the land of Israel shows us every architectural dig um, only confirms that firstly the Bible is true and that secondly the Jews are the indigenous people to the land of Israel because if you, deep, if you dig deep enough in the land of Israel you will discover a Jewish history. Yes, um, it, if you dig in Israel you'll find a, a Christian history, a Muslim history but the deeper you go the more Jewish that history becomes. And so uh, you, you might say, well, pastor, many of the Jews that are in Israel today um, come from the USA, uh, Europe, or Russia. Okay, I, I understand that. But the question is, how did they end up there? They ended up in America because we chased them out of Europe after the Holocaust. Many, many uh, Jewish people, uh, either before World War II and the years leading up to it, uh, fled uh, to America. Um, uh, and... and uh, Many of the Jews that ended up in Europe or Russia ended up because the Romans chased them out of their land in uh, AD 70 when the Emperor Titus, um, afterwards to become uh, the, uh, the General Titus, afterwards the Emperor Titus, um, uh, chased them out of the land of Israel. And so you could say that Europeans um, uh, drove them out in the first place. And it may be inconvenient truth, but it's truth nonetheless. And, uh, you know, there are those who say Israel is an apartheid state, and yet, if you look today, Muslims and Christian citizens enjoy equal rights and freedom of worship. And so, all I can say is this, having an opinion is one thing, but be very careful in condemning or coming against those whom God has called. Because, like I said, the Jewish people are called. Balaam discovered this to his detriment, as did Pharaoh and the Pharisees. Acts 5 and verse 33 in the message when they heard that, they were furious and wanted to kill them on the spot. But one of the council members stood up, a Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel, a teacher of God's law, who was honored by everyone. He ordered the man to be taken out of the room for a short time. And he said, fellow Israelites, be careful what you're going to do to these men. Uh, uh, Teudu made something of a splash, claiming to be someone, and got about 400 men to join him. He was killed, his followers dispersed, and nothing came of it. Little while later, um, at the time of the census, Judas the Galilean appeared and acquired a following. He also uh, fizzled out, and the people following him were scattered to the four winds. So I'm telling you, hands off these men. Let them alone. If this program or work is merely human, it will fall apart. But if it is of God, there is nothing you can do about it. And you better not be found fighting against God. And I think we would do well to heed that warning ourselves. Okay, Israel is not beyond fair criticism, but there are those who seek to undermine or destroy Israel. Um, ultimately, these people are coming against God because criticizing a policy is one thing, but calling for genocide and ethnic cleansing is another. And that, that is why those who say Jews need to be taken out of the land of Israel, that is what, that constitutes ethnic cleansing. And certainly it's not something the Bible uh, would call on us to support. And, and this is why those who seek to destroy uh, Israel are, 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 this is what they're calling for. You go to some of these uh, protests and they, they chant the same thing, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. Well, free of what? Free of Jews. And, and so that's what they're calling for. And so Israel has fought many defensive wars since its rebirth in 1948. Yet in each instance, they won against all the odds. Why? Because they're called. And you can't contain those whom God has called. They're like a cork. You can put them down. They'll pop up again. That's why Romans 11:29 says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. And so Israel's continued uh, existence is assigned to the nations. They are the fig tree that Jesus spoke of in Luke 21, 29. He said to them, look at the fig tree and all the trees. And so you could say that Israel is God's timepiece. If I want to know what time it is, I just look at my watch. Well, Israel is like God's watch. And so um, uh, Jesus said, when the fig tree buds, referring to the rebirth of the nation of Israel, know that it's near at the very doors. And, you know, looking at our society right now and the chaos, destruction, and depravity, we see all around us, it's an indication of the fact that we are in the end times. Nobody knows the day or the hour, but we can certainly know the season. And so I'm going to be doing a, a, a series on end time events 
uh, soon, but, but much of it cannot be understood unless you first grasp the significance of Israel and the Jewish people, because Israel is the fig tree that budded, that Jesus spoke of. And so, as believers, we need to have the humility to acknowledge that uh, just as God chose us before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.7, uh, Ephesians 1.4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So just as God chose us, so too he has also called and chosen the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. In fact, the gospel is to the Jew first, and that's what the Bible says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so this indicates the unique calling on the Jewish people. And many people wonder, why are you so pro-Israel pastor? Because God is. And I choose to love those whom God loves. Okay? And it may not be popular, may not be politically correct, but I don't honestly care because I want to be on God's side. People are always talking about, oh, you need to be on the right side of history. Well, I want to be on the right side of God. And more than important, being on the right side of history, I want to be on the right side of eternity. Amen? And so this, this is something we need to be mindful of. And uh, I might not always understand God's purposes or end goal, um, but it's obvious that the truth that not only transformed our lives and our eternal destinies, but that of our nations and societies came through the Jewish people. And so, I've said it again and again, God revealed himself to and through the Jewish people. And I thank God that he did, because otherwise we would all still be in ignorance and darkness. I mean, just look at India and, and the oftentimes strange and revolting idols they worship. These strange creatures with multiple heads and limbs and, and, and all of these things. And yet, in the absence of the Bible and the truth that it reveals, who's to say they're wrong? Who's to say God isn't like that? Well, we have something that says he's not like that. It's the word of God. The, the, and, and so, like I said, God revealed himself through these people. And our understanding of God, therefore, came to us through the Jews. That's why Jesus said salvation is of the Jews. It doesn't mean that, you know, that we're saved uh, by the Jews, but salvation came through the Jewish people. And, and uh, of that, I think we should be grateful. How can we not, therefore, love, appreciate, and stand with, and pray for uh, the, the Jewish people? And, but you might say, but pastor, Israel is secular and sinful, as are our cities and our nations. So what is your point? Uh, because are we praying for mercy for Dublin, for London, for New York, for Beijing, for Lagos, for Rio, for Moscow, for wherever? Of course we are, yes. Well, why not Jerusalem and Tel Aviv? Their sin does not negate the supernatural calling that exists on this people and nation. Genesis chapter 32 and verse uh, 22. We see here um, Jacob had this divine encounter uh, with the Lord. And that night... Uh, he, it says, um, then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till the breaking of the day. Now when he saw that uh, he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, uh, because God touched him and uh, again, I believe that touch is on the Jewish people. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have prevailed with God and with men, uh, for you have uh, struggled with God and men, and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So uh, then Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And just as they, he crossed over Pen Peniel, the sun rose in him, and he limped on his hip. From then on, you, you could tell that Jacob was a God-touched man, because it even changed, it didn't it just change his name, it changed the way he, he, he walked. And so it, it's interesting that the name Israel was given by God and not by man, to the patriarch David. And it was a new God-given identity that was confirmed only after he encountered the Lord. And, and in some ways, I believe the name Israel is a reminder that the Jewish people are a God-touched and a God-called people. Have they always been faithful to that call? No. Ultimately, this is why they were judged and uh, their temple destroyed, not once, but twice. Idolatry brought them down. And in some ways, I, I believe ancient Israel is a warning to the modern world. We stray from God and his ways at our pearl. And yet this is what our society is doing. We murder millions of babies. We deny, we deny God's hand in creation. 
We, we, we reject God's order in marriage and gender. I mean, just, just look at the, 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 the White House over the last number of days and all these, these flags everywhere. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I just saw in, in Canada, they've gone, uh, we started with a Pride Day, uh, then we went to a Pride Week, and, and now it's a Pride Month, and uh, Canada have decided they're going to have a Pride season that goes from June to September. You see, our, our society is on a rapid downward spiral, and this is why we need to be in prayer. We need to be on our faces because uh, so many of these things can become normalized and, and we can become desensitized to what grieves the heart of God. And this isn't about hating anybody. This is about just simply recognizing that there is such a thing as objective truth. And our societies have turned from that objective truth. And now we're teaching our children. They've evolved from apes. We're, we're trying to teach highly sexual, sexual material to little children. We are rejecting God's order in so many areas. We're even telling, you know, boys, you, you, you might not even be a boy. You might not be a girl, I mean, and, and this is the tangent our society is on, and, and this is the irony of, of feminists talking about, you know, women being underpaid, and they can't even define what a woman is any longer. Can you, can you see how we have, you know, Romans chapter 1, we have embraced what is debased and sinful, and, and we have stepped out of the light, and we are moving towards the darkness, and this is why we have to pray for our society. Amen? And so, you know, clearly we are on borrowed time because we are, like I said, celebrating and promoting what is debased and immoral, and we somehow think that we will escape God's wrath. We need to, we need to pray. We need to pray for mercy. And so for us to be pointing the finger at Israel, we must realize our societies are just as guilty because to whom much is given, much will be expected. I mean, it's, it's one thing for us to look at the Aztecs and the Incas and see all of the human sacrifice that they carried out. Listen, they did not have the Bible. They were in darkness. They were in ignorance. Yes, they had God's law written on their hearts, but we have God's law right before us, and we violate it to the point where we, we make, you know, the, the blood they have shed, you know, so small compared to what we are doing. I mean, millions and millions of children every year being slaughtered in the name of convenience and, the, the, you know, in the name of, of, of progress. Well, I, I believe as a society, we have to pray and we have to repent. And so, but even if we have written Israel out of God's story, God has not given up on his people. We worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's very significant, therefore, that the name Israel was first placed upon a people before it was ever placed upon the land. You see, the name of the, na of the nation originated from a supernatural encounter with the living God. And so I would simply say, child of God, tread very carefully. And this is why you could say both the land and the people are synonymous with each other. There's this supernatural bond that exists between the Jewish people and the land of Israel because they're called by God to the land. They're called to be a light to the nations. Have they fulfilled this calling yet? No, not near fully, but by God's glorious grace, they will. Isaiah 49 and 6, he says, Is it not, not enough for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the protected ones of Israel? I will also make you a light for the nations, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. I personally believe that the natural restoration of Israel precedes the spiritual restoration. And so God has called out a people to himself. They were called to be a light to the nations. And truly, the Bible has been absolutely foundational to the values and freedoms we enjoy in the West. Ironically, as we turn from, uh, as our nations have turned from the Bible and from Israel, we have become much less free, prosperous, and stable. I read earlier John 4, 22. Jesus said salvation is of the Jews. And truly, as Christians, we owe the Jewish people a debt that we can, we can never, ever uh, be repaid. Because every time I open this precious book, I'm reminded of the great sacrifice the Jewish people have made to testify to the truth. Romans chapter 3 addresses this when it says, What advantage then has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, uh, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. You see, the, the, the oracles that, the, of God, the truth of God was committed firstly to the Jewish people. And ultimately... 
um, uh, you know, the Jews have suffered greatly to testify to the truth. And, and this is why Satan hates them. And, you know, many of the Jewish people don't necessarily understand that. That Why is, is, is you know, as Benjamin Netanyahu once acknowledged, that it seems anti-Semitism is the most ancient hatred. And it keeps popping up. And, and so many times the Jewish people have had to leave nations because of this hatred that rises up against them. But they don't, some of them don't necessarily understand that Satan hates them because the truth came not just to them, but through them. Amen? And so, uh, and this is why, again, I, I believe we need to, as believers, we need to stand with them and pray for them because it was through them that the truth was revealed to us. Because I recognize that just as we are called, they are called. Do you know the name Israel was mentioned 77 times in the New Testament? 2,204 times in the Old Testament. That's 2,319 times Israel is mentioned the word Israel is mentioned in the entire Bible, at least using the King James Version. And I think this in itself suggests the importance that they play in God's plan. Just by way of comparison, the word repent is mentioned 105 times in the Bible. Believe 284 times, redeemed 119, redeemed 62. Church is mentioned 114 times, Christian is mentioned three times, and personal jet is mentioned zero times. So firstly, the Jewish people are, are called. Secondly, they are kept. Psalm 102 and verse 13. You will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yes, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. So the nations shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory, for the Lord shall build up Zion. And you know, what a precious promise this is, because as believers we can claim this promise. Um, Matthew Henry, uh, in his commentary, said this, we are dying creatures, but God is an everlasting God, the protector of his church, and we may be confident that it will not be neglected. And, and so, Matthew Henry was speaking of this in the context of the church, and, and wonderful. What a precious promise we can claim, but in reality, the Bible is speaking of far more than simply his church, for it's clear that the same everlasting God, who is the protector of his church, is also the protector of his people, Israel. Psalm 102, 12 to 17 in the message. Yet you can, God, are sovereign still, always and ever sovereign. You'll get up from your throne and help Zion. It's time for compassionate help. Oh, do your servants, oh, how your servants love the city's rubble and weep with compassion over its dust. The godless nations will sit up and take notice. See your glory, worship your name. When God rebuilds Zion, when he shows up in his glory, when he attends to the prayer of the wretched, he won't dismiss their prayer. And if you take time to study the history of this exceptional people, you will see numerous instances of God's miraculous deliverance from their enemies. And, you know, if, if you ever, even if you look at the, the history of Israel from a non-faith perspective, a very clear pattern becomes evident, and that is each time they have been attacked, God has delivered them from those who sought to oppress or destroy them. And so we see these two things in their history, consistent attacks and consistent deliverance. And I believe it's testament to the fact that Israel is both called and kept by Almighty God. Esther chapter 3, and we see this uh, amazing story about how, um, you know, Esther was called and she became queen and, and then there was this plot by Haman to destroy the Jewish people. And um, uh, Haman saw that, you know, Mordecai did not bow or, or pray before him. That was Esther's husband. Haman was filled with wrath, but he disdained to lay hand on Mordecai alone, for they told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of um, Asherus, the people of Mordecai. And, and so if you look historically, um, Hitler was not the first one who sought to destroy and kill all of the Jewish people. We see Haman did the very same thing. We see Pharaoh trying to do the same thing with the, all of the young boys. And so there, there's a spirit from hell that wants to right, wipe out this people because Satan knew that one day the Messiah would come through the Jewish people. And... Um, and so, 
this, this is a you know, very, very powerful principle. Uh, you read on further that Haman actually was willing to pay to kill all the Jewish people. He was going to pay the king. And so through the ages, Satan has consistently sought to oppress, demonize, dehumanize, and ultimately destroy the Jewish people through various individuals, movements, and even nations. The Philistines, Canaanites, Babylonians, Assyrians, Amalekites, Pharaoh, Haman, Hitler, the list goes on and on. There is no doubt the Jewish people have suffered greatly, but in the end, those who sought to destroy them always failed. Why? Because Israel and the Jewish people are kept by God's power. 1 Peter 1, 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith, Unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You may say, but pastor, that's a New Testament scripture speaking to the church. Of course, it applies to the believer and is written to us. And yes, we claim many of these promises in the Old Testament for ourselves. And there's no doubt in my mind that the Jewish people and the nation of Israel are kept by God. How else can you explain how they have survived and thrived? Psalm 40, uh, 114 verse 7, O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. There is no other way to explain the survival of a people conquered and scattered to the four winds by the Romans and yet miraculously maintained their identity, their history, their faith, and the connection with their homeland and 2,000 years later regathered in that very same land. Ezekiel 36, 24, for I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from the countries and bring you back into your own land. It was utterly impossible. There's no other people that have been regathered like the Jewish people. Psalm 49 and 15, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave and he will receive me. And so the very same God who called his people has kept his people. And he has kept them from losing their identity, their culture, uh, their faith, and their dream of one day returning to their land. Did you know that the Jewish people at the end of every cedar meal used to say, one day in Jerusalem, for hundreds and hundreds of years before Israel was ever reestablished as a nation. One day in Jerusalem. And, and yet miraculously, in 1967, they regained their capital, Jerusalem. You see, God has kept them from those who would have destroyed them. And even uh, after uh, World War II, Ezekiel 37, I believe, was fulfilled when it says that I will take you out of your graves. And sadly, uh, you know, many Jewish people died in the Holocaust, six million men, not just men and women, but little children. And uh, Ezekiel 37 and verse 12, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Do you know that many of the Holocaust survivors literally walked from Europe uh, to Israel um, when the war ended? Many of them looked like the walking dead because they were so emaciated. And, um, and yet this, this scripture was fulfilled. Then you will know that I'm the, the Lord when I've opened your graves, O my people, and brought you in and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I'll place you in your own land and then you'll know that I, the Lord, have spoken and performed this. And so we have the natural restoration, but also in the next verse, like I said there, I believe it speaks of the spiritual restoration of the people. And this is why Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And, and we've seen that over and over again with the Jewish people. And, and Psalm 121, three and four, he will not suffer thy foot to be moved, he that keepeth them will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. And so be assured, God is the one uh, that keeps Israel uh, and the Jewish people. He has kept, is keeping, and will keep them close to his heart. So they're called, they're kept. Thirdly, they're blessed. I don't have time to go through there in detail. And that is the story of Balaam and, Bal and Balak. Uh, Balak wanted to curse uh, the children of Israel, so he calls Balak, who is a, a prophet of sorts, and uh, he said, I want you to curse the people. It's interesting, verse 12, and God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them, you shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. 
And I would encourage you to read chapters 22 to 24 of Numbers because it recounts in, in great detail. Um, uh, you know, the, I, I believe there was a call of God on Balaam, but uh, unfortunately, his God was money, and because of that, he, 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 he really went again God's, against God's purposes to the point where even his donkey had a conversation with him to warn him. And, and he's having this conversation with a donkey, and he says, I, I'm going to kill you. I mean, this is how deranged he was. Who would kill a talking donkey? I mean, you'd be made for life, you know, but, uh, but, but I think it's, it's interesting. The most significant thing of this is uh, even though he's being paid to curse them, he ends up three times blessing them, or sorry, four times. He blesses the people of Israel, and God said, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people because they are blessed, and that's the, the third thing we need to understand about uh, Israel is they are blessed. There are people that are blessed, you know, Israel is a land that is blessed. In, uh, in Ireland, Israel used to be known as the Holy Land before we became all woke. Um, uh, uh, because, uh, you know, there was this implicit understanding um, that there was something special about the land of Israel. Now, we didn't, in, traditionally in Ireland, we didn't read the Bible. Um, but there was this understanding people had, and they referred to Israel as the Holy Land. And so, uh, uh, the reason, of course, was because Christ our Savior was born, ministered, and taught in Israel, and it was eventually in Israel that he was sacrificed for the sins of the world, and it's there he rose again from death. And Acts chapter 1, 9 to 11 tells us that uh, one day he will return to this blessed land. And this is why the, the angel spoke to the disciples, and um, it says, a cloud received him out of their sight, so Christ ascended to heaven from Israel. And, um, and while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. <coughs> Zechariah 14, 3 to 9, and I'd encourage you, maybe in the coming weeks, you could, when the video is up on YouTube, you can rewatch it, because this is not something you get in one go, but I'm going to give it to you in one go, because next Sunday is Father's Day, and uh, so uh, just, just stick with me, we're, we're, you know, we're nearly there. Zechariah 14, uh, 3 to 9 in the Berean, then the Lord will go out to fight against these nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. This is why Israel is important. If your faith is important, then Israel is important. And this is why I think many believers are actually biblically uh, illiterate, and it's a tragedy. Because if we truly understood what the Bible says about Israel, we would love them, we would pray for them, and we would recognize the significance that land plays uh, to us as Christians. And, um, but on that day, he will stand on the Mount of Olives. It does not say that on that day, Jesus is going to stand in New York, or he's going to stand in Lisbon, or he's going to stand in Berlin, or he's going to stand in, in, in uh, 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 come on, Rome, or, or, or uh, you know, wherever else you want to, whatever other city you want to talk about, um, whether South America, whether Asia, Australia, you know, Middle East, uh, it says specifically that day he will stand on the Mount of Olives. Where's the Mount of Olives? Jerusalem. East of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west. And so when he lands on the Mount of Olives, it's gonna, this mountain is going to split in two. And uh, it says a great valley will be formed with half the mountain moving to the north and half to the south. And um, it says in the last part, it says, on that day, the Lord will become king over all the earth, the Lord alone and his name alone. And so what a blessed day that will be when we behold Christ, our Savior. And you know, it's been 75 years since the rebirth of Israel. And um, the, the prophet Isaiah asked in Isaiah 66, 8, I read it already, but he asked, can a nation be born in a day? And yet miraculously, this happened in May 1948 when the, a nation was literally brought back from the dead, a nation that had been destroyed and, and was passed away since Roman times. Think about it. Since Roman times, Israel uh, had not been a, a state, and, and yet it was brought back to life. It had to be God. And you see, as Isaac said in, in Genesis 27, 33, he shall be blessed. 
And so too, the blessing of Almighty God is evident on this little nation that has become a world leader in so many areas, including high tech and uh, 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 medicine and um, you know, it's become a, a world leader in, in many areas, um, as well as an abundant producer of fruit. And this was in fulfillment of Isaiah 35 and verse 1. And uh, I just want to read it for you here because it's, it's quite significant. It says, The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. And if you look at pictures of places like Tel Aviv and areas of Israel, before the Jews returned to the land, it was complete desert. And yet by God's grace, ingenuity, and hard work, they have literally transformed this, uh, this land. And uh, Isaiah 27 verse 6 says that Israel will fill the land with fruit. Um, you know, even though Israel is a small country, it's one of the world's leading citrus producers and exporters, including oranges, grapefruits, tangerines, and even flowers. We see this promise works on two levels, the natural, the supernatural. And I believe it's going to speak of a greater spiritual blessing that will come when Israel awakens to its true purpose to be a light to the nations and bring in the end time harvest of souls. And so consider the, uh, the blessing that the Apostle Paul has been to us because so much of what we call civilization has been influenced by the life of this one Jewish man who had a heart for the Gentiles. So think of the blessing that will come when the people of Israel awaken to God's call and turn from their sin to Christ. You see... Israel and the Jewish people are blessed because God is a covenant-keeping God. Psalm 105 and verse 8. And it says, He remembers his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as an allotment of your inheritance. And so Israel and the Jewish people are blessed because God's a covenant-keeping God. So just give me five, six minutes, I'm finished, okay? God is a covenant-keeping God. And, and let me say this, wherever the Jewish people have gone in the world, they've made a great contribution to that nation and were blessed as a result. Fact is, many times they were so blessed that people were jealous of them, but the Bible promises that God will bless those whom he chooses, Exodus 33, 19. I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim uh, before you my name, the Lord, and I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And whether you like it or not, God has been gracious to the Jewish people. The fact is, he refers to them in Zechariah 2 verse 8 as the apple of his lie. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory he sent me to the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. The new living, for he who harms you harms his most, my most precious possession. You know, Deuteronomy 28 talks about the blessing of God. We always read it at a wedding ceremony. You know, you, you'll be blessed in the city, you'll be blessed in the field, you'll, uh, you'll be the head, not the tail, above and not beneath. You know, this is the reality. All the Bible verses regarding blessings that we rightfully claim for ourselves as Christians were first and foremost given to the Jewish people. And they have not been rescinded because, again, Romans 11, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Are they walking the fullness of that blessing? Not yet. But the rebirth and continued existence of Israel um, is nothing short of a modern-day miracle because in spite of the hostility, the lies, the threats, the attacks, the prejudice, and if any of you that are online, you'll see a lot of anti-Israel, a lot of anti-Jewish conspiracies. Oh, they're behind this, they're behind that, they're behind the other. You need to understand where a lot of that is coming from. It's coming from hell. Because God sees the call. He sees, you know, what, what he did through those people. And unfortunately, I think in many instances, Christians are utterly blind to this. That's why every year I'll teach on Israel and... and you know, people are not going to be, yes, praise the Lord, hallelujah. But that's okay, I don't care, I'm going to teach it because I know it, I need to give you the whole counsel of God. And if you don't get this, nothing is going to work for you. Nothing. Un until the church gets this revelation, we're not going to see the revival that we're crying out for. So anyway, it's important to understand. Um, as believers, we need to intentionally stand with and bless the Jewish people. I'll bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. Genesis 12 and verse 3. And so, one of the reasons I believe God is blessed 
this church and this ministry is that we deliberately and intentionally bless the Jewish people in Israel. And uh, surely it makes sense to bless those who have blessed us. They've blessed us with the scriptures, with the Savior, and with salvation. It came through them. And so uh, Israel and the Jewish people are called, they're kept, they're blessed. And finally, two minutes, I'm finished, they're loved. The Jewish people are loved by God. Second Chronicles 6 and verse 4 talks about how God chose a people for himself and saying, blessed be the God of Israel who has fulfilled with his hands what he spoke with his mouth to my father David saying, since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I've chosen no city from any tribe of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there. Nor did I choose any man to be a ruler over my people Israel. Yet I have chosen Jerusalem that my name may be there. And I've chosen David to be over my people Israel. Israel. You see, God chose a land, a city, and a people that he would both reveal himself to and through. And his voice, his nature, and his will have been revealed uh, to all of mankind um, uh, through his dealings with the Jewish people. And, and though at times God has dealt harshly with them, there is no doubt that he loves them. Deuteronomy 7 talks about how they are his, his treasure. Uh, you know, Hosea 11, I'm not going to go there, but uh, 1 to 9 talks about how God uh, speaks almost like a father with his child and, and regarding Israel. And, you know, if God so loves the Jewish people and we love God, how can we not love those whom he loves? And yet, unfortunately, there's large parts of the church that are buying into the faulty theological view that, that God has finished with the church, with the, with the people of Israel, and the church is now Israel, etc. And like I said, there are, there are multitudes of Bible verses that will never make sense to you if you believe that. And so, um, uh, and, and so how do we navigate this? Uh, as I finish, as the worship group come forward, how do we navigate this? Be, being mindful that there is so much negativity and hostility towards Israel, even among some Christians. And, 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 and also, there, there are many Jews who feel the same way about us. I, I understand this is a two-way street. There's hostility on both sides. I mean, recently, a small group of ultra-Orthodox Jews in the Israel government recently sought to ban the preaching of the gospel in Israel and make it punishable by imprisonment. Now, to be fair, the Prime Minister Netanyahu assured Christians that, you know, the, the Israel government wouldn't allow any such law um, to pass, but clearly there are tensions. And, you know, in this series, this two-part series, I've made no efforts to, to, to hide that fact that t tensions exist. But the question is this, the title of the series is Israel and the Believers. So how are we to relate to Israel? I think the question is, how does God how does God relate to the Jewish people? Well, Exodus 3 and 6, then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You see, God calls and literally identifies himself uh, by their name. And uh, if God loves the Jewish people and stands with them, then I believe as Christians we should, we should too. 1 Corinthians 13, 8, love never fails. Ask yourself, how would Jesus want us to treat his family. I don't know about you, I, I have family that are not necessarily walking with God. I'm sure all of us have, and yet we love them where they're at. As a pastor, I always say that to, to you know, members of our congregation, if you have family that are away from God or children that are away from God, love them where they're at. You know, too many times we, we draw kind of boundaries and we kind of cut people out of our lives. But I think we need to love people no matter where they're at. That doesn't mean we can endorse where they're at or encourage or, or, or support where they're at. But we can love them where they're at. And I think the same thing applies to the Jewish people. How, how would Jesus want us to treat his family? Because the Jewish people are his family. Matthew 25 and 40, the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And there's no doubt that the Jewish people were his brothers. He even had, Jesus had brothers, read the Bible, and they were Jewish. Um, Psalm 148, and he has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. And so the Bible is very clear that the Jewish people are close to his heart. And it succinctly expresses God's deep love for his chosen people, the Jews, because Israel is a nation and a land that is close to God's heart. It's, it's clear, 
I believe, studying the scriptures, that Israel is a nation that is uniquely called and kept and blessed and loved by Almighty God. Romans 11, 28. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Jeremiah 31. I have loved you with an everlasting love. So it's clear that God loves the Jewish people. He loves the nation of Israel. And I think it's important that we do too. My last Bible verse is Psalm 122 and verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. And so I believe God wants us to pray for the protection and the prosperity of the Jewish people and the nation of Israel and for a national spiritual awakening. If you could stand to your feet today. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you, Father. I know I shared a lot of Bible verses today, but I truly believe that God still has a plan for the Jewish people. And, and in the same way, I believe He has a plan for you. When we look at how God has been so faithful, He has been so faithful in spite of, at times, their unfaithfulness. We can take courage that, you know, even though at times we have fallen short, God will be faithful with us as well. Even when we are not faithful, He remains faithful, it says in the book of Timothy. God is a faithful God. He keeps His promises. He keeps His word. And He will keep His word to you. And so today, before we finish, I just want you to bow your head for one moment. Consider God's faithfulness. He has given us great and precious promises that by these we may be partakers of the divine nature, the Bible says. This is why, as believers, we have hope. Because we have read the story. We've read the story of God's faithfulness from the very Garden of Eden when He promised the Redeemer. And when, you know, thousands of years later, that Redeemer came when the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Christ took upon Himself flesh and He lived... Uh, you know, in the land of Israel and he lived a perfect life and, you know, he revealed truth. The Bible says, you know, uh, the, the servants of the Pharisees came back and said, no man ever spoke like this man. There is no religion out there outside of Christianity that can reveal to you the truth about eternity, about life, about death, about eternity. That truth has been revealed through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so I want to ask you this question. Are you ready to step into eternity? Because you have an eternal soul, and you will spend eternity somewhere. And the Bible is very clear that there's only two alternatives, two eternal destinations. Eternal blessing and joy in heaven, or eternal sorrow and torment in hell. Have you found peace with God? I'm not asking, do you pray or are you a good person? I'm asking, are you ready to stand before your Creator? The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life is a gift that was purchased by Jesus Christ at the cross. He shed His blood for your soul. I want to ask you today, are you ready to stand before the Lord? The book of Amos says, prepare to meet your Maker. You don't prepare by being a good person. There's, there, you might be good, but you're not good enough. There is only one thing. Like the song goes, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so I want to give you an opportunity today. As we consider God's faithfulness to the Jewish people, I want you to consider that God has been faithful to you. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. That whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We have a problem. We are sinners. We, we fall short. We know it in our hearts. But this is why God sent the Savior. He sent the Savior, Jesus, to take our place on the cross. So that we could be forgiven. So that we could be free. So that we could know God. And so we could have that assurance that heaven is our home. We don't have to fear death when we know Christ as our Savior and our Lord. And so with every head bowed, I want to ask that, that question. Are you ready to stand before the Lord? Do you have that assurance that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life? If not, put your hand up high and I'm going to pray for you today. If you'd like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just put your hand up high and I'm going to pray for you today.